Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the South Africa podcast. You're listening to myself, Ivic Wolf, and Scratch. And tonight we have the special, or our special guest, in Tanya Song. Ah, uh, gig who do you need? Tanya Song, Ani Anya Atom, Savin Tadkab Imne. My name is Tanya Song. Uh, I'm Atom, and uh, that's the uh, where I come from. I'm a musician, I'm a furry, and uh, I'm uh, American, Indian, and Mexican. I'm a, I said that earlier, I'm Otham, and uh, I'm glad to be back uh, once again with uh, South Africa. <laughs> and it's, uh, we're glad to have you, of course. it's It's been a while, it's been, what, almost a year since we last? I think spoke? it's been a little longer, even. A little bit longer, yeah. Mm. A year and a half, maybe. Yeah, so everything's it's, everything's difficult. <laughs> it's been a while. Everything feel time's just slurring. Everything is just mm. like congealing together in one big lump of time. Yeah. You know what's interesting is that um, time, as seen by a lot of indigenous people, is not linear but rather circular. And I think when I I think with the pandemic, which has sort of warped most of our senses of time you kind of go back to thinking about what that what circular time means and kind of it starts to make sense a little bit it's really hard to explain if you're not like thinking about it but um i i think it has been really interesting to see how our experience of the world is just uh, uh, how it's not as uh concrete as we think and it's um so easy to break apart when something pokes at it yeah, no, definitely. I mean, what was it? Like, I keep thinking that last year was 2019 rather than it was 2020, well, for instance. Yeah. Well, to be honest, it was the last year anything happened. Because <laughs> yeah, everything just ground to a halt. But then again, I mean, so with, with that as the experience, um, obviously, like, a large amount of the things that we do when it comes to being outside, um, how do things change uh, when it comes to like your experiences? I think for you, like how has the pandemic affected you? You know, it's very interesting because I don't want to be one of those people who said, "Hey, let's look at the bright side of the pandemic." Because you know what? There's a lot of awful things that have happened, and a lot of people who have experienced loss. And I think it would be disrespectful for me to say there's a bright side. But more what I'm trying to say is it did force me to do things that I would not have otherwise done, I think. Like, uh, and there are two things that come to mind. And one of them is that um, first, I, I'm i far more in shape uh, physically than I was before. And um, that's mainly because I started to go out. Uh, and for those who don't know, I'm, I, I have lived part-time in the U.S. Southwest, and I lived part-time in the uh, Dakotas. And um, I've been out in nature hiking more, and I've been finding a lot of um, myself through prayer in, in, in going on these hikes and finding these really scenic locations to sit down and just kind of say, hey, this is... Um, this is what life is right here and not just me but how i relate to the rest of the world like understanding like starting to familiarize myself with plants uh and learning the native names of them too and what they're for what our people use them for and it's been fascinating to kind of look at it and say wow you know this is um this is very interesting this is uh i'm finding my roots here uh and I think with the distractions that were going on in the day to day before the pandemic, it would have been a little bit harder or a little bit slower to do so. Um, and then the other uh, part of it was, uh, which is the, I think the one that a lot of people will be interested in is that I've started my, an album, my own uh, solo album, um, which I'm hoping to have released by BLFC. I don't know if I'm going to meet that deadline, but I'm definitely planning to have it for FC. Uh, I know we're in, uh, this is a South African podcast, so I, uh, I don't know how uh, much your listeners will be familiar with the US cons, uh, but FC happens in January. It's uh, as long as nothing uh 
catastrophic happens. Um, so that's my goal right now. And I and I wouldn't really, I don't think I would have started or have gone as fast as I did had it not been for everything that happened that kind of just changed our routines. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely, that's actually pretty awesome. I was wondering, I was, I was going to ask uh, at some point about whether you were considering um, actually putting out you know, some form of album or uh, maybe, maybe tell us a little bit more about the album actually, since, since we're on the topic, like what, yeah, what so, can we expect? Yeah. Yeah. So at the, t at this moment, uh, I also, since I have the opportunity to advertise, I want to say that I also have two singles that are out right now. Uh, and, and I'll just like briefly talk about those two and then I'll get into your question about the album, if that's okay. Sure. Go for uh, it. Um, so I have two, uh, I have two singles out. Uh, and uh, you can find them on my Bandcamp, which is uh, uh, my Bandcamp is T O N Y A S O N G. Uh, and so, what you can do, uh, so the two songs I have up are song. The songs are called Condor Awake and Profound Encounter. And Condor Awake was the first one I released. Uh, the Condor Awake kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, it was actually born out of a bit of uh, tragedy and sad news uh, for, I'm going to try not to get too political here, but if you don't know too much about the Americas and, you know, the history of colonization, I know most people have a vague idea that it happened, but in one particular country in, in South America, in Bolivia, uh, an indigenous man managed to gain the presidency and he's been, well, he hasn't, he's been far from perfect. I, I don't want to idolize a politician. It, what it did do is prove that indigenous people can regain our power in our own lands. And so it was seen, at least for me and for a lot of people, as like a hope that like, it's not impossible for us to regain our sovereignty. We have, we are living under occupation, most of us. I consider myself as living under occupation. My ancestral lands, autumn lands, are divided by an inter international border um, that for us has never existed. The The land north of the border and the land south of the border is, border is the same. It's the same plants, the same relatives, the same ancestors, the same language. And what the the reason so i wrote a song i wrote that song of uh, condor awake about bolivia because in 2019 a coup happened basically and a more westernized government westernized christian government took over uh and it was a government friendly to all the western countries again and so it was a for me it was a very blatant take back of what we were gaining as uh indigenous people uh and just like a cr it was crushing for our hope and so i started writing this song I, I, it was uh born out of sadness that all this had happened and before i released the song the previous government regained power so the indigenous movement regained power so um by the time I released it, uh, things had gone better again, so to speak. Um, and of course, politics are very complicated. There's no black and white. Uh, and just because a government is indigenous run doesn't mean um, it is good by default. Certainly, uh, for those who don't know, we have a lot of tribal governments in the north, in the northern hemisphere, shall we say, that, you know, could that don't serve our own interests. They're in a way they're like banana republics. Right. Uh, where they they're sort of you know, funded and certain to work to serve a, a, an even higher power, so to speak. Mm. So basically that's what Condor Awake is about is is that hope that um Bolivia uh, gives indigenous people by showing us that we can regain uh what once what was once ours and so and well the awesome thing about condor awake is that it has about um um uh, about 
14 or 15 live instruments. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a whole wind band. Uh, and all those instruments are about, are done by three people. Me, uh, Runt, who's on drums, and Rhubarb the Bear, who's on uh, uh, trumpet and trombone. And it's just us, like, recording ourselves over and over, doing the different harmonies. And so it sounds like a big uh, wind band. And it's, uh, that's what I find pretty cool about that song. Awesome. That's actually amazing. But do continue. And so, so the other single... The other single is uh, Profound Encounter, which is, uh, to keep it simple, it's an expression about being trans and sort of how we're spoken to and how we're treated and how we have to struggle to even discover ourselves. Like, we, it, like if we as human beings could be ourselves from birth, then there would be no need for this so much painful self-discovery, if that makes sense. Like, self-discovery is always happening, but it shouldn't have to be painful like it is. And it's painful because we're not accepted. We're not... We're treated as such an outsider still. We're treated as, like, this anomaly. And we are hidden from the public for, like, systematically. So that's what that song is about, is just this is this is who i am this is not it, it we're not the things you say we are this just is this is just who we are this is we we just want to live and we want to love and we want to be loved and that's what that song is about and that's uh me that's uh that one i did by myself that song i did by myself on piano vocals and flute uh so those two are the singles that uh i have out so uh, be sure to look them up if you're interested. My band camp is Tanya Song, T O N Y A O S N S. Sorry, T O N Y A S O N G. And as for my album, um, the album is titled Let Me Go, which is kind of on the same sort of theme of, you know, uh, allowing myself to be myself. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I went through Catholic school. Uh, you know, and ironically, you know, my, my experience of Catholic school wasn't horrible per se, but it it did teach me things that I know are that work against human values. Would, which sorry, is, just go ahead. Uh, a, a quick question: Is that just Catholic school at like primary level, or is that also yeah, primary, in secondary? Yeah, I should have. Yeah, like a first, second, third grade kind of thing. Okay. The U U.S. first, second, third grade. I'm not sure how the South African school system works. Sort of works. But basically, but yeah. Go. Sorry. But but uh, so uh, they kind of tell you you can be anything you want to be, right? And that's like all fine and dandy. But really, there are some parameters that you're not allowed to go past, and if you do, you start to get some pushback. And so, no, not really. You cannot be whatever you want without a huge amount of pushback from the same people who are telling you you can be anything you want to be. And uh, a lot of that sort of theme has uh, is is what the uh, album's about. So um, there's there's a song about um, there's a song about that specifically, and then there's a song about uh, about what the world tells us as native people about our about stereotypes about us and how we're not the stereotypes as native people that people tell us we are and it's uh also there's also the the last song which i'm quite not not quite done with is a song about um how we haven't died as as native people despite being forced to conform into this bubble or where oftentimes it was conforming into this bubble or being killed literally as it ha has happened to us um it is still happening, so isn't it so yes uh absolutely and the continued struggle for land rights and resource rights and we see that today in in line three in minnesota where uh native people right now even are uh at the time of this recording are are fighting to protect that land and really protect all of us uh, because uh, the climate crisis is real and indigenous people have been in the forefront of this fight since long before anyone else. And yet, even by 
most good willed progressive minded people were still an afterthought to most everyone so uh there isn't as much of that last bit in my album but it is a lot about you know being our being our ourselves as native trans people especially um and me being myself it's more of a self-expression more than anything and i'm sure a lot of people will be able to relate to the songs within the album uh and but mainly i want it's a it's a big act of self-expression for me because i mean what's pretty much what what you've been sort of saying so far is is that it, it pretty much answers to the first question that we wanted to ask you is that question about you know you yourself and the convictions that you have um is there anything else that you'd like to sort of expand on beyond just the album itself like what exactly makes tanya song stick uh, word that i'm trying to figure out is what, yeah what what, what, what makes me i'm uh, what makes I'm, only, you I'm only reading the uh, i'm reading the question so uh i think what you're trying to ask is what does what makes me me yeah for, for lack me. of better terms yeah what 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 moves me forward yeah um so i'm i i want to give a really good answer and i think that what makes me so motivated is that I've grown up seeing adults, mainly white adults, say this is what's good and this is what's bad, and realize that actually so much of it is wrong. Let me let me provide a very, very clear example. You're in South Africa, right? You're in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who says it's the South? Is there like a north south out in space? Okay. Interesting. All so right. I mean you could very easily draw the uh world map upside down and it's still perfectly accurate. However, we draw it with the uh, certain with the uh, North America and Europe on top and that's uh you know there's it we've kind of just accepted that as as default, you know, and that sounds like a minor thing, but there are many things that we talk about that are kind of not what we've been told. For example, who says what's forward and what's back? We all, we kind of read from left to right, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and forward is often to thought, like when, uh, I don't know if you saw this over there, but Hillary, when Hillary Clinton was running for president, her slogan was forward and the 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 logo was an h with an arrow pointing to the right mm -hmm. you know what i mean so yeah. why is forward right uh, yeah i suppose that has to do with the with the convention of reading from left to right people assume yeah. and yeah. so and so there are, and there are a lot, a lot of other but the biggest one for me this one is the one that is most prevalent in Western society. Why is the dark bad and why is the light good? Hmm. Yeah. No, it's that's you, definitely yes. Go. Yeah, and uh, so uh, because if you think about it, because especially in if you think about it from biblical terms, which is really even uh, non-Christian, non-Jewish, non-Muslim people. They also use the dark and light metaphor. You see it mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, but if we only had sunlight, the plants would die. We would burn. We would. Um, we wouldn't survive. The darkness is just as important to us as for our survival and for and for our well-being than the light is. That makes sense. And this metaphor has also been used in terms and. Ver both figuratively and literally, to describe our skin colors. How lighter is perceived as good and darker is perceived as bad. And we see this especially in the most literal form that I know of in Mormonism, um, which is a prevalent religion in the part of the country, the Southwest, where, uh, where I'm from. Yeah, well, Mormonism is... Well, it's... Interesting. That's crazy. I'm yeah. gonna say. So what? So that was a very long answer to your question of what what motivates me is, 
we is and I, I used a lot of big metaphors there and maybe I went on too big a tangent, but the biggest one is why is colonization seen as progress? Because it still is, even by well meaning progressive minded people, is that the that progress is gonna happen from the point in which we are right now, rather than from the from the perspective of an indigenous person. Hmm. And this is where things like the climate issue have been so separated from indigenous issues. So many progressive minded people don't even think about indigenous people much, or they think about it as a, as a low priority uh, issue. And yet, a lot of the, the modern day issues right now we're, we're facing with climate have to do with the fact that we are uh, ma extremely marginalized from society, even though we were the first to sort of get, get the ball rolling on on this kind of activism, you know? So um, that's, a, that's a very long answer to your question of what my convictions are, but my convictions are, and my convictions really are that all the people I see around me who are largely indigenous, I don't want to see us fighting for our lives all the time, especially when I see that there are so many white people. I'm just going to put it out there. It's going to be very blunt. There's a lot of white people living it up in these lands, lands stolen from us. And it's impossible for me not to see that injustice. It's impossible for me to see the very nice old white lady who is by a perfectly lovely person kind of just let me keep suffering and let my friends keep suffering and let my family keep suffering. So follow up to that. I just want to ask, how would you, how would you, how would you approach it? What, what would be a, a usable, change to the way that people act and react then what what's something that 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 can be used to fix that so th there there'd be a number of steps that would need to be taken uh education would be the very very key one most people in the united states do not know who uh whose lens they're they're living on who are the original people of the lands they're on uh very very important that they understand whose lands they're on and what the modern day uh, uh, issues are that they're that those people are facing. Some in some places they've been far removed. For example, uh, the Cherokee people live in Oklahoma now, even though they're from North Carolina. There is also a North Carolina band of Cherokee, but there are a number of way removed uh, uh, indigenous people. And those connections still need to happen. Same thing in New York with the Oneida people who are now in Wisconsin. As uh, uh, as uh, the late Charlie Hill, Native community would say, we had a little bit of a real estate problem. Um, and so that was that's step one. People need to know whose land they're on. The, the other issue is uh, understanding um, the land they're on in general. Um, I, I wouldn't say this is necessarily step two, but this is a step that needs to happen. Uh, in the Southwest, and I keep referencing the Southwest because I'm from here, it's really easy to make this uh, analogy. The water usage here is absurd, and it's because people do not understand how to live on these lands. And so you see a lot of uh, people with grass lawns in New Mexico and Arizona, mm -hmm. and it's an, a waste of water. And some people make the argument that, oh, uh, it's it's good in other ways and, and whatnot. But really that it's um there are you see grass lawns as this land is going through exceptional drought so it's um and and people don't really care because they're not connected to these lands they're not trying to make those connections to these lands and they're not trying to make connections to the and to indigenous people and most people the the hardest thing to get this process started is because uh the hardest thing keeping this process from getting started is that too many people just live in comfort they feel like they can afford not to think about those things they can even say oh that is bad you know it's really bad that native people are treated poorly and it's really bad that we treat the earth poorly 
but ultimately they will go back 15 minutes later to their to a fairly wasteful way of living and i want to give a caveat here that i am not an exception here i can improve uh myself on how i live my life as well i don't want to give a like a make it seem like i'm hypocritical but it's a it's a it's a step we all have to take shall we say mm -hmm. And uh, I'm working toward that, and, and I've, as I mentioned earlier, what really has helped me is uh, going out into the and 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 going on these long hikes and understanding the plants, because now I'm seeing what they do th do throughout the seasons. Like the pandemic has lasted uh, more than an entire year, so I've gotten to see how these plants behave, and I've gotten to know them, and I've gotten to see why they're important and why my survival actually depends on their well-being you know even with this modern technology that we have today so going back to the question uh so people need to know whose land they're on people need to know the land they're on also and people need to be proactive in indigenous rights and indigenous sovereignty they need to um start talking about it in their social and political circles because there are so few of us indigenous people it's ugly to say it that way but the percentage of us as is in relation to the population of the u.s is so small that it is going to take non-natives being proactive and saying this is an issue native rights are a pressing issue and they affect me and yes they do affect you they will affect you and the sooner people realize that, especially in regards to climate change, but in regards to other things as well, such as how the capitalist system is crushing everyone, the sooner we re people realize that, the sooner real solutions can come forth. Uh, because presidents come and go, senators come and go, rep representatives come and go, and, you know, uh, you regular uh, mill white uh, millennial... Your rent keeps rising, uh, and you know the, the person you're you're paying, the landlord you're paying, that's not their land. Do you ever think about that? Mm. The issue is on is honestly, it's very similar to what South Africa sort of has. Um, it's something that isn't necessarily spoken about very often. Um, the comparative point is actually the. Uh, in the Western Cape, uh, Scratch, you're going to have to help me out. I keep forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, District 6. No, not District 6. Uh, the... <sighs> me and this name, for some reason, I've, I've been telling it to my students. For Khoisan? goodness knows. Khoisan, yes. The okay. Khoisan are the original people of South Africa, mm -hmm. but they've been... They were pretty much just um, almost rooted out by colonialism as well to the point I was that say not are... only colonialism i mean yeah i mean uh, if you if you go back far enough uh zulu and Kosa people have also come from different yeah. technically countries i mean the they Khoisan were the, yeah the yeah they came from the north yeah and did pretty much the exact same thing there was colonialism throughout every single group that came through the Khoisan being the original uh people of this country of South Africa were pushed towards one side and then it became part of the Cape Flats. And mm -hmm. now there's there's barely anyone left. At this point, um, the language itself has died out to the point that I think, if I'm not mistaken, there are, and there were several of them. I mean, I'm talking about like almost 20 to 30 to 40 different Khoisan languages of which only, I think, three are still being spoken and by the three that I'm talking about are spoken fluently by anything from six to 20 yeah. people left. That's the kind of dire situation. So we, we do understand uh, that kind of situation. It's it's just oh, like- you, you say understand, we have a similar in, situation. Yeah, we have a similar situation, yeah. Yeah. So do you know why, um, uh, on that same topic, do you know why language preservation is so, uh, important like why why the focus on 
on language preservation because that is, that's a big issue for indigenous people over here as well. And uh, that's one of the efforts that I've, I'm have i also a little bit lagging on is trying to learn my language is, uh, but why is that so important? Um, what, what, why the focus? Why is that, uh, why can't, for example, why can't, why couldn't native people regain their cultures and just speak English? Because why, why the language? Language uh, and, and culture the, are literally, the same. if you, if you lose the language, you lose everything that the culture came with. Mm. Exactly. Uh, so for example, um, my, so my name uh, was given to me by, uh, uh, a, a Navajo elder. So my name is actually Navajo, even though I'm Autumn. Uh, and my name is uh, Nio Hatakli Hashtin. And um, that uh, means wind singer, uh, loosely translated. Uh, the word for singer, the, the, uh, sorry, for the word for, um, yeah, the word for singer is also the same word for healer. And Interesting. why is that important? Because it tells us of how we see certain things and you know um there's an equivalent in autumn that i'm kind of forgetting right now uh that i used to that i also made at one point um i'm, and I'm trying to recall it right now but it's not coming to mind but um oh yes okay so when you when you greet someone in autumn depending on what time of day it is you say, uh, if for any kind of day, any t moment of the day, you say skiktash. Uh, but for the morning, you say skiksyalek. And then you say, um, for afternoon, you say skiktamjuk. And for afternoon to evening, in between there, you said you would say skik imbijuk. And evening, you would say skik hodunig. And for night, you would say skik shuhugam. Now, so, what? So, you could translate those as literally, "Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night." Right? However, the literal translation says a lot more. Um, the literal translation uh, for "skuxialek" is um, "the sun is rising well for you." Oh wow! And the afternoon. Skiktamjuk is like the sun is rising. The sun is over your head in a good in a good way. And so, what when you get down to it, it it really does talk teach us about how we see the world, because our language does things that are sort of um, that sort of um, that the English language just does not. And that's mm. why language preservation is 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 so important. And one of the other things that I, I I raised this question, and it's really hard to know, but I raised this question at a panel once on uh, native cultures, uh, uh, at the at uh, university, at, uh, here in the United States, and I proposed that maybe our words, and it's going to differ from language to language because there are so many tribes in the United States, but I said. Maybe our words for man and woman are not as literal as translations as we think they are. And what if they say things we haven't discovered yet? Not discovered, but rediscovered, you know, because they're already there. But what are we losing by making these translations that are sort of correct, but they don't tell the whole story? And that's why language preservation is so important. There's so much in the language to learn, to teach us. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, like, the the reason why I immediately tacked on with you is my background is actually as a linguist. Um, so a large amount of my conversation with my students is always trying to figure out, you know, what the connections are between one language and the next. And it's, it's absolutely, like, staggering, sort of, firstly, like, I mean, we have, technically, we've got 11 official languages, but between that, I mean, there's there's groups of languages that have changed somewhat. There's a difference between, say, uh, if you look at Zulu from the mid-city of uh, Johannesburg versus Zulu in um, okay, so then, 
yeah, in KZN, yeah. KwaZulu Natal, there I've I've heard it so very very often that when they're speaking Zulu to one another, uh, the Zulu that's spoken in the city is considered to be almost dirty, uh, childish, in comparison to the Zulu that's spoken in KwaZulu Natal. Uh, because of the way that the the language has been learned, and it's it's something that needs to be taken into account as as often as possible. Language literally forms the way that we understand the world around us, and losing those bits of language is it's it's losing entire cultures, and we we can't continue to lose cultures because it's it's just not viable. It means that you forget who you are and if you forget who you are then what's next yeah well i can i can, I can definitely tell you what happens when people forget who they are they live like they do in in a lot of places in the united states where they just kind of let water let the water run on their in their faucet because they're not connected to their water source anymore or they're not trying to connect to the water source where they are because a lot of us do migrate that's a, even a normal part of indigenous life before colonization you're no one's trying to make those connections anymore and seeing how you as a person you as an individual relate to the land you're you're, you're on and that's not unique to to native people white people can make those connections they just choose not to because they're at a uh, shall we say like a, a lower starting point that's uh, doing using lower to higher again they're from a uh they their starting point is 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 even Basically. further back than um than f it is for native people because we have more or less an understanding at least even colonized more or less an understanding of where we come from and we have some general knowledge that is even for the more uh, assimilated ones of us kind of like have relatives that have thrown some knowledge our way about yeah that river is important to us or that uh valley is important to us and just like some things here and there that kind of give us give us a starting point that would be harder for white people to to start with but that doesn't mean you know that that can't happen and it needs to happen because oof we um society is as it stands is not viable it's not sustainable no, absolutely true. Uh, Scratch, do you have a question that you want to ask Tanya? Um, hmm. I mean, yeah. Following on the on the topic of uh, uh, language um, preservation, um, for I suppose a, a Western audience, something that's kind of easily digestible in that regard is nineteen eighty four which I read a few years ago and like the um, the idea of language being perverted by people even like not necessarily like making a language die out I mean you can't it's difficult to think without a language so changing the language itself changes the way people think and in this in the same vein eradicating a language completely wipes that cultural influence off the map so that's a very like I, I think if, if anyone sort of wants to look up uh, or sort of wants uh, something to read about the concept of uh, uh, how a language can be twisted for people in power or, or for this for the sake of the people in power I think that's a good place to start and then from there on delving deeper into uh, forgotten languages uh, language preservation that kind of stuff yeah yeah um interesting thing i mean one of the things that i note quite often uh, just last i think maybe just the last point on language mm -hmm. um is the fact that language gets like it's it's that use of subversion that that we find quite often when we look at um english being spoken in different regions when that english gets regionalized to particular areas so i mean there's there's a particular kind of english that you would find in different areas dependent on the 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 group of people that are speaking there um it gets integrated so in other words it's not just it it 
it's to to some extent even English is subvertible. Oh, any um, language is subvertible. Yeah, but in 1984, like I said, it was about the English language being like twisted and made new to suit the goals of Insoc. Yeah, but the thing is, what I'm trying to say is, is that it's not just the overarching. Uh, the mega corporation, so much as we could say it, but also mm -hmm. the the minor groups, the the groups that would be sort of under the boot of um, of that ideology. They could use and subvert any language. Any language can be subverted. Oh, totally. So rather, yeah, rather than being, uh, which is pretty much what Britain did. Uh, to be very fair, they came in. They said everybody needs to speak English. Uh, because otherwise you're considered to be non-human in very, very, like, basic terms. Um, and it can't just be any English, it must be the Queen's English. And in America, it's the American English. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Tanya? Uh, I don't think, I don't know that I had much more to add to that yeah. conversation particularly, but... Um... That, that certainly that's the importance of uh, indigenous language indi mm. indigenous languages oh, for sure. yeah and I sincerely hope because again like it's I think if there if there is a way that we could start doing that for because I know that again and it's it's something that I want to be able to start talking to my own students about um, with respect to uh, the Khoi language, like I said, there's 50 odd people who can speak variants of the language itself. Um, if there are ways that uh, that we can sort of help reignite a need for the language to be preserved, because there's literally uh, like three three teachers, and one of them is 70. Uh, yeah. Um, how how do you how would you propose teaching a language that apparently there there's little to no interest in, even amongst the people who'd be speaking it? That's a very difficult question. I'm yeah. certainly not a teacher, and uh, I, the it seems to me that the one of the most effective ways, um, at least for the time being, are our immersion schools, and those do exist. Uh, the, the, uh, obviously they vary um they vary uh, in availability depending on where you are but um uh but they do exist and um it's it, how do you motivate people to learn a language is is it's very uh mm. it's it's very difficult when uh you're trying to sur when tr it's a lot, in a lot of cases you're just trying to survive to also be motivated to say hey by the way uh, your culture is depending on you learning your language uh when you're kind of just like i don't know i'm just trying to pay my bills this month i don't know if i'm even gonna make it and i'm worried so much about that that i can't focus on my anxiety is shooting through the roof and i don't know if i'm gonna even be able to you know if i'm gonna be homeless uh next month uh and and then on top of that you're telling me i gotta learn my language uh, so it very much is a it's it's a very complicated situation and for me one of the most amazing things that we that could be done that that I don't think is ever going to be done is for he's a scary word in the United States reparations in the form of because of uh, all the news we've seen uh, in regards to boarding schools, uh, I don't know if it made it out all the way out your way, where I've it was discovered. It, yeah. it was discovered that now we're in the thousands of children uh, in unmarked graves, uh, thousands of native children in unmarked graves that um, these boarding schools were just hiding. Oh shit! Um, it it would be it would be very uh, fitting if the churches funded. Not ran, but just funded the uh, funded uh, language immersion schools uh, because I think that they are the most responsible. I mean, a lot of people are responsible, but 
certainly it would be in their in their interest uh to uh, as a pr move even to start funding that kind of thing mm. but that's really what i think is is uh, would be the ideal move to make is is sort of i mean you can in the united states everyone's a fraidy cat nobody wants to say what people should do and we see that with the masking uh bs you know but really that's really what should happen is that they should be made to fund these schools yeah because they they got money for it they did, certainly got money for all the, uh all those kids that who's who they somehow lost i mean we know that it was intentional at least I believe so. I know some people will debate that, but that language preservation wise, starting a new generation of children who can who are speaking it in an immersion school, that would be uh, a huge step forward. Mm. Yeah, and it's so, uh, it's yeah. also difficult because I mean, it in uh, something like a lang like a immersion uh, culture like. Uh, not immersion culture like an immersion school or whatever your your brain is a sponge for new languages when you're like up until about the age of six if you can't oh, more than huh more than up until about 12 to 13. oh okay well fair enough but i mean like like it's maximum spongy at like yeah. <laughs> just below six and yeah. getting someone to learn a new language outside that age bracket is difficult have you ever have you tried sticking to duolingo it's it's impossible <laughs> but then again duolingo is a uh, an oppressive owl yeah fair enough but i mean even then it's even with the owl like breaking into your house it's it can't get you to take spanish like or german or whatever you want to take and like it's it's difficult to sort of like how much of a how much of a language relies on it being spoken as opposed to knowing it like um even for us like secondary languages like uh or Afrikaans or something or well, secondary for some people um mm. like I'd love to take Kosa but I don't have anyone who I can speak to uh, yes, with do. it like you have a plethora of different people that you can immediately speak to yeah but not yeah. the people I speak to on a daily basis no that's that that's where the lub, uh, where the rub lies. Yeah, of course. So, and but my my point still stands. It's it's difficult to immerse people in a language when the language is, as you said, it's something that they need to take sort of in conjunction with gestures vaguely in the direction of everything, all of this as well. But from if if it's done from a from uh, as as Tonya I think um, suggests. If it's done from a youth perspective, oh, of, course. of course, yeah, that's that's I think the the sort of crux of the matter is is that immersion schools for people growing up into the language, growing up into the culture. I'm I'm sorry if I'm speaking for you, um, Tanya. Is is that where we were going with that? Well, yeah, that's what I that's what I was mentioning. Is the language immersion schools yeah. is, is seems to be an effective way. Hmm. To uh, and I'm sure there are other ways that uh, people who specialize in in language will tell tell us for sure uh, because language is not uh, a specialty of mine or or has it been a uh, one of the things that I, I I know a lot about in terms of how to teach it. But I mean, like you can still advocate for it, which is sort of what we've been doing here, I think. Yes, of course. Um, I do want to move on to one of the next points here. And again, uh, when I put them down, they were out of order. So I'm going to move on to the question about your particular persona and sort of how you project it on social media. Do you think that it's different from the way that you uh, would put yourself out as a, as, as a private individual? I don't know how people would perceive me uh, in person versus uh, on social media. I do find that uh, social media does provide a, an outlet to speak about sort of things that um, are not easy to bring up when you're among, uh, for me anyway, things that are not easy to bring up if you're among a bunch of white friends and seeing as how... Uh, 
a lot of people around me are white, especially in the fandom, that I can't exactly just hey, say, interrupt a conversation about I don't know what, and then say, hey, suddenly interrupt and say, hey, did you know that this awful thing is happening to Native people? It's not practical. Uh, and social media has, like, provided uh, a space where it, I can just put out a thought and it implant it into other people's mm. minds in a way that's not interrupting a conversation. Uh, yeah. And it and and I I have noticed that it has allowed then subsequently for me to talk about it after the fact in actual conversations. So yeah, I would say that on social media, perhaps I'm not exactly like I am in person, but I think there are practical reasons as for why that is. Uh, in person, you know, I'm. I think I I would hope that a lot of people find that I'm just pretty easy to hang out with and mm. and whatnot and that um i don't shy away from saying what i actually feel um uh, and and i've worked hard to make that happen because i have been shamed for so long for the way i think and been made to feel that i'm wrong so mm. it's been hard to come out of my shell in that regard because again going back to the album discussion all the things that i've been told I should should or shouldn't do have weight on me. It's been it's stuck to me and it's hard to break free of that. So I try to keep them the same, but I think there are inevitable differences that are just the fact of that's just the reality of social media. Mm. Also also the nice nice thing quote unquote nice thing. I don't like social media at all, but I mean the one thing about social media is you can be very very on one topic on a social media account like i mean as businesses obviously have their own social media accounts like you can be very specific towards one brand or one idea or one one thought one uh cause whatever it doesn't have to like you as as an individual are rounded and you have different uh things that make you you so when you decide to go on a social media like not vent, I mean, go onto a certain social media account, you can choose, okay, I will be more proactive in this part of my life here. I can be more proactive about this part of my life in here. Not not so much saying that it is, like, you choose to separate it. It's just, you can choose to separate it if you want. Like, you know, if, if that makes any sense. Maybe I'm just rambling. Yes. Yes to I'm rambling? <laughs> Yes, that that's sort of how I think that is how social media works. Is that uh, you can't put a thought out there when it comes to you, mm. and in in a way, and focus on on a certain topic, which I have certainly focused on native issues as they I find them to be so underrepresented in in the discourse of the world. Oh, of course, uh, yeah. Um, it's just the system, the system we have in general is completely unsustainable. So there's a lot of things that go by the wayside in in our current. Um, current way the world works, unfortunately. I mean, and, and that being said, like being sort of, I guess, I'm, I'm going to call it furry adjacent for now. Um, when you're making these sort of statements and, and you're talking about these issues uh, from from that kind of perspective, like what has been the general response to it? Does it feel like you're... Uh, Yeah, what is it? What has been the general response? Is um, yeah, general. Response. It has shifted. It has shifted over over time because in the early days of social media, um, so my 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 spot on Twitter specifically, which is the one a piece of social media where I'm most active, has always been primarily a furry, um, a sort of uh area for me just I, I i follow i began following friends and then i began following artists who i like and um there were a couple of events that took place that suddenly catapulted me into uh in two different directions uh i think oh yes it was around the time 2013 i want to say when the there was an indigenous movement called idol no more and I started using social media as a means to talk about that issue. And that issue in particular was when former Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Stephen Harper, 
uh, I believe it's been a while now, and that was my fir- that was the first time um, I had sort of gotten into it. Is that um, he had uh, privatized a lot of uh, na- um, native lands, yes, uh, but a lot of just like in general uh, wi- uh, wilderness that was going to put the environment at risk. And uh, indigenous people stepped up and said, "No, we don't want this. This is uh, this is our land." And a lot of the privatized land was treaty land. Uh, so that was the first um, sort of movement where I got involved in on social media. And I follow people and people follow me back because I had gone out to some of these protests to um, participate. And I had used social media to say, hey, this is happening. I'm here. And this is what's being talked about. This is what's happening. And so uh, I gained uh, uh, a non-furry following from that. And then, um, so after that, I'm trying to uh, recall the events. So after that happened, I still, as that was happening, I still at the time was pretty much, as far as I knew, the only indigenous person within the furry fandom uh, who, who was active on social media. And so... It was a little bit tough because being such a white-centric uh, fandom, uh, a lot of people were very openly being hostile to the things I was saying, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a nice time. Uh, I, I will say that much um, because at the time, everything I was saying about indigenous rights it was not talked about at all. It was so far away from everyone's mind that every everyone was just like, "What is this thing you're talking about?" That was so far in the past, you know, uh, and not understanding how it, it these things were unfolding in front of me because I am in an I am indigenous and I'm in around other indigenous people who are directly affected by this. So early days, it was uh, rough. A lot of people responded negatively, very negatively, and it wasn't until then, and it wasn't until that uh, I made a statement about appropriation that uh, I got a backlash from a larger account. At the time, it was larger than the account I had. And that person, by doing so, threw a lot of uh, their following at me. And at the very same time that happened, a lot of people who didn't know about me also followed me. And that was like the a, a moment where I unintentionally gained a little bit more prominence that I wasn't expecting to have. Yep. Um, and all publicity is good publicity, question mark? Uh, well, it sort of have, has become that. But as as time has gone on, to, to shorten the story, to not make the story to go on too long, um, more furries have opened up to like with the things that I've talked about. And more indigenous furries have been on Twitter now. And there's a lot, there's a lot more now. So I'm not speaking by myself, and I'm not the only one saying the things I'm saying. Now there are multiple people sort of corroborating the things that I'm saying, that I have been saying. And so it doesn't it isn't it doesn't come off as just some like outlier thing anymore. If you mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it gives clout so to your over to your time, argument. Uh, if, if yeah, I hate saying it, but it gives clout to your argument. It's like more voices to the to the pile. So, yeah, I would say that as of late, I wouldn't say that the hate has gone away, but the the amount of death threats, literal death threats that I got into Jesus. my DMs back then, compared to now, it has significantly re- been reduced. Um, uh, it's been uh, e- it's in some ways easier, in some ways harder, um, but there's certainly a um, I, I certainly have a lot more um, agreement, shall we say that that than I used to have, mm. and it's made it th- it's made things better for me to speak. Uh, I've had to fight for it. Uh, I've had to prove that what I what I have been saying is truth. Um, but it has fi- I, uh, it's been sticking more. I, I, I've persevered and and it's been happening. That's good. I mean, and- yeah, the characters or people like uh, Tempo and Shuki, for instance, um, sort of joining the call as well, uh, 
must obviously help with with I think the overall sort of general push forward to get those issues out there. Uh, yeah. Which, yeah. A lot of people, for sure. Um, okay, I want to move on to this question. Uh, what would you actually like to see more of in the fandom itself? And why? I would like to see... I think that when I go to certain... Let, let me say this much. I haven't been to a Fermi in a while. Mm. And I Did think I? that's because... Um, I find that more... First of all, I'm an introvert. So it's partially a me thing. It's partially a me problem. Uh, but also... I feel like that's a, a place... Like, a, a lot of fur meets, when I look back, were places where I couldn't speak freely. And by that, I don't mean I'm going to go to, like, a, a bowling alley and start talking about politics. It's not that kind of I couldn't speak freely. But, you know, this isn't a, a thing that happens, but this is a, 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 an example that might happen to you, for example. Where someone, is, there's a lot of, there are going to be a lot of people that are, like, outspoken about something that you really find you disagree with and to some degree you have to be quiet for the sake of keeping the peace uh, keeping the peace exactly so like it's just some rando it's like I, I not to bring up the cop issue because i know it's sensitive uh but just like for example i think we should defund the cops and if i hear someone say Ugh, people who who want to defund cops, like I want to see what they do when when people when they call nine one one and no one comes, and I and I'm just like, uh, well, I don't want to disturb the peace, and like, uh, there there is no uh, productive conversation to be had in a bowling alley, uh, mm. when the individual who said that it also has had a few drinks. Oh, totally. So, um, so it just becomes a place where. It, you kind of just feel that you really can't just openly openly speak. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, answering your question, however. I, I think mm -hmm. that, that continues to be a sort of uh, what I think. So forget, uh, well, no, don't forget everything I said, but forget everything I said in terms of answering that question. Let me try to get back to this question and see if I can answer in a different way. Sure. I certainly like would like to for the fandom to be a place where um, everyone feels safe uh, and everyone with an asterisk because okay that's gonna lead to the inevitable argument of well shouldn't Nazis feel safe and when I think about it um, why is a Nazi in the furry fandom? Uh, you know, uh, if the furry fandom wants to claim that it's like this diverse, uh, welcoming space, then it can't have a group of people that are not welcoming to another group of people in that way. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and it also needs to be a place where minorities and especially people of color can openly talk about their negative experiences when they happen so that we can continue to grow. The fandom is never going to be perfect. Forget any like illusions that will reach some point in time where we've figured everything out. We have every conflict resolved. Everyone gets along perfectly. That's just never going to happen. However, I, I feel as if that's off that we've kind of got been stuck in well what's the w everything is fine don't talk about the issues uh just let everyone have fun which not everyone can have fun if you don't ha uh, um if you don't um work on these issues this these issues where people of color are sometimes made to feel uncomfortable sometimes intentionally sometimes unintentionally and those who do it unintentionally should know that they're doing it so that they can work on that. 
and not have it be a guilt thing or or anything like that just a yeah racism is kind of built into our society and a lot of us don't realize we're racist even people of color can be racist to other people of color for example uh i've certainly found that i've um had some thoughts in my head and i'm like wow i can't believe i thought that that's really awful of me you know but if i'm not addressing that i'm not going to improve myself so things like that things like things um in regards to trans people feeling safe, uh, certain we've had several issues that I don't want to name in in detail, but of trans people not being not being kept safe in furry spaces, and that's unacceptable. And oh, damn. Uh, and as a secondary part to the uh, answer to the question, it would be great if the fandom was a place where a, diver a diverse amount of people were uplifted. Um, because I do feel as if perhaps um, the fandom has created these sort of bubbles and a lot of people pride themselves in the fandom not being like the mainstream, it being a different thing that mm -hmm. doesn't work in the same parameters. But in a lot of ways, it does. We do have our own sort of celebrity, so to speak. We, we we certainly have these hierarchies that I think are not... We're not built intentionally, but they're a product of the fact that we all still exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're building plushies of furries that are prominent within the arena that in and of itself is part and parcel of that sort of problem that we have to deal with. So why exactly would you want to buy a plushie of a particularly colored furry? Like, and then a, a mass produced version of that as well. So it's yeah, not and I, no by cool. the way, and, and by the way, just to clarify, I don't mean that any celebrity is bad, no, uh, agree. but not by any means. Uh, but it's, it's more the way this the way society treats celebrities. Uh, that's, you know, that's kind of where I was going with that. Oh yeah. That's skewed. Um, shit. Um, yeah. and it's a very complicated question because mm -hmm. even like, I, I do feel as if in the fandom, the fandom is certainly a, one of the places where I feel I, I can most be myself and that yet I also still deal with the real world issues and so, it's not and 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 i feel, and i find that a lot of these issues are not unique to the phantom and people get so proud of the fandom that they get defensive if you say something about the fandom but really it's these are just issues that the real world needs to work on mm -hmm. which is why i have never believed that the fandom is an escape it's really just an extension our own little extension of the real world yeah I mean, with that being said, I mean, um, when it comes to, say, conventions and going to conventions, uh, do you think, do you believe that it's the responsibility of the convention runners to be more inclusive and to ensure that the environment uh, is of such a nature that everyone can thrive in it? So before I answer this question, um, uh, I just want to like, give you like a caveat that I've never been in a uh What's it called? A convention staff. That's fine. Uh, so so I, I just want to like point that out so people know that I'm coming from there, and I know that a convention staff work very hard to make like three days out of the year uh, really awesome for a lot of people, and that means doing. Um, that means you will probably not hit all the marks, and I understand <laughs> that bit as well. And I'm just trying to give that caveat before I say the rest i'm, I'm asking that said sorry I'm, as, I'm asking this as a person who with along with scratch here we actually both uh, help run the south africa convention so this question is it's, it's research it's research <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i i think that yes absolutely it's the responsibility of convention uh runners to ensure safety ensure uh inclusivity and once again, it's 
uh, I think it's an impossible to hit a 100% mark, but I think there is a certain benchmark that needs to be needs to be hit uh, in order for that to, you know, for for a convention to be successful, not just in numbers and not just in attendance, not just in like how much it made for a charity, but just how many people actually feel like this is their space. Fair enough. That's a good assessment. Mm. I agree with that. Mm. Uh, I know there were one it... or two people who at our previous con weren't mm -hmm. completely satisfied like with the with the outing itself. And I mean I guess that's something we could we could go back to them and find out what we work what we can work on. Like yeah. what made them want to want to leave early, for example. So I know that like again, when it comes to feeling safe in a particular area, it's it's very, very difficult at times to and especially on the spot try to figure out how to deal with a uh an an issue that, that does crop up. Um and there have been several times that, you know, issues may in fact have cropped up, but they were kept silent until after the convention had finished. Mm. And by that point, what exactly can you as a convention, you know, runner do aside from ban them from the next convention? Oh, I mean, yeah, uh, it, it depends. Like if it's an issue that's kept quiet because it was like something experienced by someone just like on, on like in the sense of, uh, oh, I didn't like, I don't know, the food or I didn't like, uh, I didn't like that many people around me so i didn't enjoy it that much that's fine like and people keeping that to themselves until the end of the con that can sort of be detrimental because we learn from that stuff but like mm -hmm. actual cases of people being like stalked harassed stuff like that yeah. that needs to be open like asap yeah it really should be and that's something that maybe needs to be communicated more to people that people I think that there's a lot of people because because again the fandom as I said earlier is an extension of the real world. Of course. There is this feeling that if you say something, if you say something happened to me, some someone assaulted me, that it's going to be treated the same way society treats it, which unfortunately it does not get treated with very with a lot of serious uh, uh, seriousness. And so there is a th that that's where maybe that con a convention can say, look, we're going to take this seriously and we're going to prove it to you somehow. I wouldn't know how to do that. But, you know, something that kind of is put out there that is not just within a, 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 a big list of guidelines, but something that maybe is more prominent out there. I'm just throwing some ideas that I don't know if that that, that would be even effective because I, as I said earlier, I have never been in a con staff. Well, fair enough. I mean, it's 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 for us to sort of peg how yeah peg our ideas or our performance as con staff going forward. So this is good information, definitely. Hmm. And uh, sort of based on, uh, granted, like, what's the word? When it comes to being a performer, uh, you've performed at a variety of different conventions. Um, what have the conventions done, for instance, to help you really feel like you were, you know, adding to the, uh, adding to the sort of, I don't want to say the word glamour, but the the experience of what the convention was like as as a performer do you feel that uh conventions uh, uh, are doing enough uh so the answer to this is has to the last part have have the convention has made me feel like i've added a lot honestly no uh and but i i, I that sounds ugly and i just kind of like want to like you know, butter it up a little bit, I think. But the main thing is, for most conventions, I haven't been the main attraction. I've been kind of a person in a band. So it's been, in that regard, I can understand that they they can't go in and the, maybe the stock cast, uh, the 
the con staff can't go to every single individual and say and to every single individual say thank you so much and and all that uh some cons have been uh fantastic in that regard though like uh for, um blfc has been awesome every time i've gone um and performed uh and and then some other cons i've kind of performed and then that was it like no one ever said anything to me after or one person said to me something but overall the convention was just kind of there it was just like you offered you did it and now it's done like it feels sometimes and i can only sp uh i i don't know if this is the experience for everyone but sometimes it feels as if um it feels as if the con is saying well, here's a space if you want to use it use it uh, and then it's all yours and then that's about it it's not it doesn't feel it doesn't particularly feel at least for me like uh, in for for not all cons obviously but it, it does sometimes feel as if they um if we, as if our work as musicians specifically is as appreciated if that makes sense Okay. Yeah, definitely. I feel okay. like in general, I I, I think I think I, I'm not in this world, but I think DJs have kind of felt the same thing in some cons. Like, just like yeah, we're we're providing quite a performance, and there are a lot of musicians in the fandom who put a put some pretty good performances out. Uh, truth be told, and in. Uh, so, it I I'm, I've been kind of iffy about how I respond to this question because again it's been varied. Uh, it's certainly there have been cons who have been very uh, warm and has spoken to us, and then there are other cons who are just like, okay, yeah, um, we're putting this all together, and you perform, and then that's it, and then like you never hear from them again. Okay, so I mean and. Moving moving away from that, what would you be? What would you feel is your most notable and your favorite performance, and what made it notable? Uh, I, well, I think for me the, the the most recent one has been the most notable, which is the one for AAC. It was the digital AC performance. Uh, so um, AC, um, sorry, I recorded a show. Um, uh, AC had a really awesome camera crew that uh, put together that uh, um, filmed it. It is on Anthrocon's um, YouTube channel, and I thought that was uh, really awesome that um, we were able to put that all together. And um, that was the first time I performed uh, in front of a camera. Well, well, in front of a camera crew, I should say, because I have performed in front of the camera. In front of the camera crew, all my original, all original works of mine. And most most of those songs were songs that are going to be in the album, so that was pretty exciting as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. I was actually I remember you actually sent me a link for that, and I uh, watched for a bit. Um, it was that was it was a really amazing experience. Eh? Um, I haven't ever told you that, but it was good. I I really did appreciate that. It was it was something. So if anybody's ever watched it, it is available on. Is it Anthrocon's? Yeah, it's on an Anthrocon's YouTube channel. Cool. So if anybody wants to have a look at that, mm. I should definitely do that. Look for Tanya. Uh, what was it titled? Say again? Uh, I don't remember, but it's it's pretty recent. If you just look through uh, Anthrocon's videos, you'll see Tanya somewhere mm. in there. Okay. Well, um, so Anthrocon's usually June, July, right? Yes. Yeah, it wasn't too far ago. Yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, so we can we can look forward to seeing it soon if it's not already out. Mm -hmm. So we've touched on these issues already just a, a bit, um, but I think we uh, maybe let's let's talk about trans issues within the fandom itself, and um, exactly sort of maybe a little bit more deeply as to what the what the fandom can do to make you feel more at home um so 
That's a... Let me tell you why that's a tough question. It's actually a tough question for a sad reason. Uh, and that is that um, I would say that at least for for me, the fandom has been relatively one of the safer spaces, even though it has its issues as well. Safer spaces for me to be uh, openly trans. And that's kind of sad when you think about how, how bad the rest of the world is. Um, mm. How can it be better? I think that the fandom could have uh, for sure uh, more trans people in in you know prominent levels of uh, you know of guests of honor of uh, con staff con chairs and I know that there are more now than there there have been before which is exciting and um, so just having those people and having that confidence that those people are in. Uh, the con staff that they will understand when when you when something bad happens to you when you're treated poorly that someone on staff will understand what that means and not belittle it it'll make it'll bring some confidence to a lot of trans people who are maybe concerned about safety especially since there have been some incidents recently that uh have not um been stellar in terms of trans uh safety mm, okay and then final question i think it's final question yeah we're running about like an hour and yeah almost hour and a half now so yeah so we got about eight minutes for this one do you have any favorite fandom stories anything that was notable for you so there have been a few uh fandom stories it doesn't have to be a, in a furry convention i don't think right yeah no. uh I think my favorite fandom story is there actually there have been two so they kind of like but they do kind of come together as one where I actually um went on a trip on a road trip with two other native furries and we it was fun in that I kind of said to them wow we're three furries on a road trip to not a furry convention and not a furry event. We were actually on our way to Crow Fair, which is a pretty uh, prominent powwow that happens in Montana. And it was really interesting and fun to be saying like, wow, there's like three furries and we're going to a native event, uh, which is which was really cool in a way. And that's very similar to that story. Um, uh, me and uh me uh Jules and uh so the that first trip to Montana was me Jules and Molly uh and they're both from uh the three affiliated tribes of North Dakota uh more recently I took a trip with uh Isananika uh or Wolf uh and Jules uh who same same person as before uh, you might know Asananika from Twitter. He's an awesome artist. I really highly recommend you follow him. He is uh, amazing, and he has been a brother to me. Uh, anyway, uh, we went on a road trip, and we were we went all through South Dakota, and we went to we went through to Colorado, and then down to the Southwest. And along the way, we actually met up with some native furries. So it was actually pretty cool to just connect in that way with other. Uh, indigenous uh furries uh, throughout this road trip and again it was not a shall we say furry event but it was sort of a connection that we we we, we met online and we're all from these different for uh native communities and uh that was a pretty cool experience i have to say that sounds awesome it's not often that you that you get an experience like that where everyone's sort of <laughs> sort of bound by by like so many overlapping interests and you're still like deciding to go oh well, yeah i i guess yeah you did take something inside the the sphere of those interests like the fact that you were all native and were going to a powwow so that's pretty cool but yeah it's always good to find your find your people i suppose and share these experiences with them yeah, an another artist that's fantastic, by the way, is uh, Introvert Kitten or Chabby. Uh, we we also met her along the way. Uh, she's out in uh, uh, New Mexico in, in Navajo land, and uh, she uh, is a pretty amazing artist. Uh, okay. We met her as well. 
and then I was with Jules, G J U L Z Z, and yeah, it was. There's a lot of awesome people uh, uh, in the fandom that are furries, so all of them are worth your time, I think. Mm -hmm. That's if you could. Okay, so one of the things that we'd like to do is, is obviously we'd like to talk about your up and coming. Now, this is just for the for the ending cue card. Um, when about, I know that you said that there's no date just yet, or you have an idea as to what date uh, for your album. Um, I think you mentioned BLFC? In, BLFC, yes. So, Wait, yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No. BLFC for your album, and uh, we have a link to your, if you could just pop us a link in chat about uh, to your band camp, is it? Yeah for the music if, if people want to listen to it as well your singles oh i think and, i did it wrong yeah. hold on and i believe uh for everything else we can find you on twitter mm -hmm. yeah hold on okay sure there we go i put that in the wrong order all right here we go ah there it is all right cool stuff Awesome. And again, um, do you have any closing remarks? Is there anything that you'd like to sort of say to the people who'd be listening to this? Anything? I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't talk about this particular topic during the interview, but oh, go for it. just as a reminder to everyone that native people exist and we're, <laughs> we're also human beings. We, we have this background shall we say, of, of, of our cultures and then all the genocide that we've gone through. And those are very real things to us. And at the very same time, we are still like living life. We're here. We're enjoying things. We're speaking out when things are wrong. And don't also, you know, shut, also... try not to shut us out when, when we're speaking out uh, our experiences because they will be very different than yours. Hmm. And that's just our reality. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. Hey. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we're about the half hour and a half mark. So I think um, let's wrap it up here. Tanya, thank you so much for coming along. It was, as always, great talking to you, um, giving us a lot to di digest, a lot to chew on, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Yeah. It, 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 it's always good to hear those... Um, like hear voices of uh, people who have stories to tell, history to share, um, yeah. yeah, and and uh, sort of fights to fight as always. And oddly enough, it, I, I say oddly enough, this is if you guys have ever seen the Twitter for, uh, if you've ever visited South Africa's Twitter. So oh, I constantly, at least it's been there for goodness knows how long since I'm looking at it now, since March 4th of 2018, um, we wanted to do something very story core like, which had to do with the idea of personal stories. So right at the end of this, um, Tanya, you're technically the first sort of guest that we've actually had that we just wanted to speak, you know, to you and speak to your, you know, personal experiences within the fandom, within your own life. And we really do appreciate the the information that you've given to us and, and sort of shared. Um, again, it's it's granted. Yes, we have or had you know set questions and everything like that. But the embellishment that we had and the the expansion on that was was absolutely sort of what we were looking for, and it was really appreciated. We really Thank appreciate you. you. And until we meet again. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good evening, everybody. See you around. See you around.